So in the last video, we talked about the fact that in order for evolution to take place and speciation to take place, there needs to be isolation between the populations, and then each population has to ha have different evolutionary processes from the other, and because they're isolated from each other and they're not interchanging genes, that will allow the populations to change enough that eventually they won't be at the same species anymore over many, many, many generations. So for this process to occur, we have seen it in labs, it's possible, we actually analyzed it, changes have to happen genetically in the population, because remember, if you adapt during your lifetime, and that does happen too. Variation is not just because of evolution. Sometimes animals are different from each other just because they learn differently or they change differently in response to different environments during their own lifetimes. But remember, those are learned things that could not be passed on for the next generation. You can't pass on what happens to you during your lifetime. The only thing you pass on is your genes. So in order for evolution to take place, the genes have to change. How does that happen? How does evolution actually happen? Now, I want to point out before I talk about that, that sometimes a single gene is enough to cause enough difference that will lead to speciation. You see here in this example, Example, that a single mutation caused the change in the coloration pattern and distribution of proteins around the surface of this snail cover. And because they look different from each other, the snails of the different types will avoid actually having uh, sex with each other and that will lead to the speciation between the two species. And that's happening because of a single mutation. So you see, it doesn't take much to cause speciation. Sometimes a single genetic change is enough. Now, that's not always the case, but sometimes it is the case. If you do enough that you change the temporal, behavioral, ecological, mechanical isolation between the species, it's going to be enough, a single genetic change to cause this to happen. Here's another example of that. If you move a single gene from a flower to another flower, you can change the flower so much that it will look different, yes, but it will also be incapable of crossing with the, with the original flower. So that's speciation. So life is full of examples of these things taking place and speciation actually occurring because of a single mutation. So the reason I want to bring that up is because for you to realize that it's not that hard to cause speciation to take place. At times, a single genetic change will actually be enough. Now, sometimes that's not enough. Certainly there's a lot of different genes and a lot of variation within the human species, but we're still all the same species because it's still enough similarity between all of us that gene flow and interchange and you know reproduction is still possible. We can still interbreed with each other. So we're not different species even though different populations on the earth do tend to have different genes in the human uh, kind. But when is it that you have enough change then to cause a speciation to take place? Well, whenever uh, enough genetic change happened that then it led to either pre-mating or post-mating isolation and then you have true speciation, right? To any of the methods that we discussed before, either allopatric, sympatric, whatever. It has to be enough change so that the different populations could not interbreed with each other. And how much change is necessary for that depends on each case. But I wanted to bring it up that it's possible that a small change could do that. Now, in the Origin of Life lecture series, we learn about how genes actually originated or where they came from. But once you have genes around, a series of events can actually lead to change in these genomes. For example, once you have a set of genes, sometimes duplication events will cause a gene to be copied doing errors, doing meiosis or mitosis, and then you end up with two copies of the same gene. And that doesn't really do much. Maybe it just makes the organism do twice as much of that protein. But you have two of these copies, so it's still the same organism. But sometimes what will happen is that one of those copies will undergo another mutation, and most of the time, 99% of the time, may end up be a bad mutation, which will cause problems for the organism. But this may not always be the case, because in this case that you see here, for example, the organism still has one copy of the original gene, in which case it is protected from death, perhaps, because of the presence of the original gene. Now, what this allows to do is for life to keep having attempts and new variation without the cost of damaging the organism that is there right now. And the thing is that once in a while, that you will have a beneficial mutation that will actually add something new, a new shape, a new structure that will allow the organism to perform a new function or to perform a function better than it did before. And that will create an advantage which will be selected for perhaps in the population and lead to the evolution of the species. And that's how genes actually evolve. So evolution takes place by several processes which alter the composition of the genes. Now, one of these processes is basically just changing the gene into a different, a different gene. So when that happens, you end up creating a new organism because now it's got a completely different gene in it. All right, and we'll go back to that in a second. The other way that it sometimes happens is you're going to have a duplication event when you end up with two copies, two maybe sometimes identical copies of the same gene. And that doesn't really do anything. You just have two copies of the same gene. So maybe you just make more of that same protein. It's not going to make that much of a difference. But 
if one of those copies gets mutated, like you see in the bottom here, now you have two different versions of that gene within the same genome, within the same uh, organism, kind of. Now, that's not going to necessarily lead to speciation, but what's going to happen is it's going to add something to the, to the genetic code, right? Uh, like a different variation of that gene. Like, for example, you see the genus A gene here getting changed into the genus B, but you still have the genus, genus A, so it's still kind of of the same uh, species, but with something added. Now, this new gene could be beneficial and do something new that actually adds a function to the, to, to the, to the, to the genome, or it could be deleterious. But even if it's deleterious, it might not necessarily cause the extinction or, or a problem for that organism because the original gene is still there, so it may still be able to do enough to survive, right? And that's how things evolve because as time goes by, duplication events and then followed by mutation events which change the genome while preserving many of the original genes. So this is called genetic conservation. The genes are conserved through time through this process. Now, of course, it's possible that the original gene also mutates to the point that you have um, two genes which are not the, like the original. So, like now, or even if you didn't have a duplication event, so let's say you have only one original gene, but then enough that gene changed without being duplicated. Now you have a second gene that's completely different. Or when they, although how they show you in the picture on the top, where what's happening is that maybe you have the duplicated genes, but when they split. Uh, one set gets damaged on the original while the other one does not. So now the, the organism on the left side, the organism on the right side are not the same anymore. And so you're going to have uh, different genomes completely. And that's going to call or, what we call orthologous genes. You don't have the original functionality because you change the gene completely without preserving its original structure. So remember, paralogous genes occur within the same genome of the same species when you have several versions of the gene within the same species. Orthologous genes happens when different versions occur in different organisms. In other words, where there is a mutation that causes a change where one organism has one type and the other organism has a different type. So you see the difference? Paralogous is two types within the same person or the same organism. Orthologous is two different types in two different organisms. So obviously, the one that leads to the speciation the most is going to be whenever you have orthologous genes. All right? And remember, what you can be changing there is a duplicated gene or even the original. But what matters is that those changes will create new variety and that could lead to evolution. Genes that are going through this process, each of these versions of these genes will be called a module. Now, because sometimes the original version is conserved, you know, it's preserved in a genetic code, it is possible for life to evolve without necessarily hurting the organism because all it's doing is adding new things and sometimes because you have the original still that protects the animal from extinction. And that leads to more vari variety within the population and changes within the population. Now remember that as you separate the populations and then each of the branches the, uh, experiences uh, new mutations, then you're going to have orthologous genes, different genes in different people, and that's going to need to actual speciation. All right? But at either one, the idea of these modules or these blocks of gene, different genes will actually lead to more variation, and that's why... Uh, we also have evolution, right? Together, mutations to existing genes and duplications followed by mutations will add new information and change the genetic code over time and just add stuff to it. Now, sometimes those additions will be lethal. Sometimes it will cause problems. Some, But sometimes, even if it's rarely, it causes an advantage. That will cause natural selection, will make it more likely to survive, and that will make the, the organism over a long period of time become more common in the population and lead to evolution like we talked about before in the microevolution lecture series. Now, this process is only one of the ways in which this can happen. The other way that this can happen is what we call axon shuffling, all right? Now, imagine that you have a certain gene, all right? Now, remember that the gene is a, is, is a set of instructions that you need to make a certain protein, right? Now, if you start looking at that protein, you will see that the protein is actually made of many pieces. So maybe you have several pieces on this protein. Now, the whole thing is a gene. So this whole thing here is a gene because each gene makes one protein, right? Or several. But normally, you have one gene per protein. Now, then you have piece one, piece two, piece three, piece four, and piece five. Now, remember from what we just talked about that it's possible for a whole this whole gene to be changed, right? and duplicate it, or you have just a gene being changed without being duplicated, or you just have, you know, two different versions of the gene, 
all these things can happen. But what can also happen is you can start shuffling the pieces because of errors doing the copy process. Again, maybe the three goes where the four belongs, so you shuffle these pieces around. But if you shuffle the pieces around, then what's that top happening is that you change the structure of the protein. Now, if you're shuffling it like that within the same gene, it is also possible that a piece from a certain uh, gene ends up in another one, completely different. Now, let's say you have a different protein then, you have completely different protein, it does something completely different in the body, but because of an accident during the DNA copy process, a piece from a completely different protein hit, it fits there. Now what you just did is you change the structure of that protein. Now, sometimes that's going to be a bad thing, sometimes it's going to be a good thing. And sometimes this is going to be happening on the only copy you have of that, of that gene, so that's going to lead to orthologous genes, completely new genes, leads to speciation. But sometimes it will happen on the duplicate copy that you have. So you still have the original, but now you have a different one that may or may not be beneficial. So when you start putting all these things together, shuffling the pieces of the protein around, adding pieces from other proteins to, to, the, to the different proteins, you start moving the building blocks to proteins, which we call domains, and you start making different versions of all the genes. Now, these different versions, if they're beneficial, if they add anything at all, if they give any advantage to that protein, to that structure of that protein, then the protein will be selected for by natural selection, and then you're going to add to the genetic code. So that's how evolution can add information to the genetic code over long periods of time. And these movements of, of pieces are accidents. They're mistakes that happen because of what we call transposition events. By the way, one of the reasons that that's happening is because, remember those duplications we just talked about? If you have these duplications taking place, remember how it works doing uh, division, doing meiosis, for example, especially on sex cells, that there's going to be pairing between homologs, right? And the, the whole pairing happens because the gene that's here and the gene that's here, they're called homologous pairs, right? We learned about that with the genetics. Now, since they're homologous, they're, they're similar genes, so they're going to be attracted to each other, and that's how they pair up. We talked about this when we did meiosis, okay? Now, remember those duplications that we just talked about? If you have, say, a chromosome that has a certain gene over there, and then you have a duplication event, and that gene, there's another chromosome that has two pieces of that gene, right? Now, because these are attracted to each other, that piece could be attracted to that piece, and then you start getting this. Uh, sometimes what will happen is that they will pair up, even though they're not really homologous to each other, and they will, it will do crossing over, even though they're not supposed to. So during crossing over events, sometimes pieces which are not supposed to cross over, cross over together because the genes are so similar from each other. So every time you get the piece from another protein and you put it in a different protein because of an accident, you create areas which are of the genome which are similar to other areas of the genome, and then they will start attracting each other, and then because of those attractions, sometimes they'll interchange pieces, and it will lead to even more shuffling. So that is why... You don't need to understand exactly how that happens, but what you do need to understand is that because of duplication events, mutation of changes of the genes, and because of transposition events, which happen a lot of the times because of similarities that exist within one gene and another, it leads to changes in the geno genome code that over long periods of time can lead to evolution. But that is not the only way that, some, that uh, genes evolve. Sometime, com sometime completely new genes evolve, all right? So sometimes it's, uh, research shows that um, it's possible for you to comp evolve completely new genes quite rapidly. Uh, one experiment, what, what they did, is that they got the virus and they purposely mutated the virus to remove a piece of its genetic code that it needed to do a certain job. And then obviously when the virus tried to do its job, it was in a and at first there was a problem for the virus, but then only a field of matter within 30 generations or 30 cycles of the, of the lifetime of the virus, a new gene evolved to, to, for, to fulfill the same function of the gene that was removed. And that was not a gene that was altered from the previous existing gene or a duplication that was left over on the genetic code. No, it was a completely new gene that evolved in only 30 generations to fill the job that that virus is, uh, needed. So when all is said and done, what ends up happening is that you're going to have all the different types of genes in your body, sometimes genes that came from one original gene. So I like to think of it as adaptive radiation at the level of the genetic code, right? And that is what's happening at the, at the, at the level of the genetics to, to create the evolution that we see, all right? But 
even this is not the only way to create uh, new genes, all right, or create variation within the, uh, evolutionary variation. Sometimes what it changes is not the, the gene that codes for the protein itself, but something else entirely. And we'll talk about these things on the next video.